Hi, I'm Jeremy Koch, and these are a few examples of my audiobook narrations. First, a reading from Bigfoot in the Bronx by Hunter Shea. Vito stepped back, suddenly aware that he was holding a rifle and within the sightline of over a dozen confused people and growing. It went into the park. Of course it did. A whole lot more ground to cover over there. Police sirens sounded off close by. Vito would bet they were in the cemetery and heard the tremendous crunch of metal. Let's go back to my truck. We can't walk across the road like this. Shea kicked the fence. We also can't get from here to there with all those cars in the way. Unless we ditch the guns and go into the park unarmed. Here's a short selection from No Birds Sing Here by Daniel V. Meyer, Jr. Chapter 1 Quiet! Beckman projected through the cloudy, dirt-streaked window glass to the cats in the alley below. Almost every day now for the past month, they had met at the same time, at the same spot, to square off and defend their strand of dented, slime-lined garbage cans. At first, he had watched the cats, fascinated with their determination, their pure jungle ferocity. They didn't waste time yowling in those days. It was a quick warning scream, almost inaudible, then the thumping of tightly muscled flesh on the ground, the rattling of old newspapers, and garbage can clanging against garbage can. Two grown men could not have made as much noise tearing one another's throats out. But now, after many battles, after they had shredded each other's ears and streaked their faces with Frankenstein scars, the cats had settled down to a wary truce, content to face each other on diplomatic haunches and scream defiance, yet realizing that further struggle was useless. Beckman thought that this would be an excellent metaphor for his first novel, just the thing he had been looking for. Here's a clip from Omega Task Force, Book One, The Emissary, by G. J. Ogden. The Emissary Sterling heard a grunt of pain and a scuffle of boots against the solid wood floor, but with the light suddenly going out, he was temporarily blinded. Mercedes, talk to me, Sterling called out, taking cautious steps back while trying to compel his eyes to adjust, but he could no longer see the colonist or his first officer. Damn it, I've lost him, Banks replied. He hit me and ran. I, I don't know where. Sterling followed the sound of Banks's voice, but he could barely make her out in the gloom. Everyone stay sharp. This is a trap, Sterling called out, continuing to back away from the colonist's last known location with his weapon raised. Sterling then felt a hard thump to the gut, and he was driven back across the polished hardwood floor of the bank. The attack caught him completely unawares and stole the breath from his lungs so that he was unable to call out for help. Before he knew it, his attacker had driven him hard into the wall, bruising his back and shoulders. Then he felt hands sliding around his throat and begin to tighten their grip, squeezing his windpipe so that he couldn't breathe. His training kicked in, and Sterling thrust his arm up through the colonist's hands to break the hold. Twisting his body, he then drove his elbow into the man's sternum as hard as he could. Here is a short selection from Santa and the Magical Dog by Fionn Spencer Larson. Santa and the Magical Dog Rose lived with her owner Susie in a little village where there were lots of other dogs to play with. Susie and Rose went shopping. Rose's favorite shop was the butcher's. She got a treat. Rose had breakfast before Susie went to work and then waited for a long time. One day Susie said goodbye to Rose. She kissed and cuddled her like every other ordinary day. Rose got down from the fence and waited. 
She tried playing with her favorite toys, but it wasn't fun. Susie finished work. She was ready to go home for Christmas, but her car was broken. Susie had to phone the garage to get the repairman or woman to come and fix the car. Day got darker, Rose felt hungry, a nasty tomcat jumped on the fence and frightened Rose. The cat was scratching on the fence and made a hole. Rose got cross. Rose barked and tried to catch the cat. Rose could fit through the hole to next door's garden. Rose had a good sniff around the garden looking for food as she was hungry. Rose was staring at the stars, wishing to be warm inside. She was feeling hungry. Santa came falling out of his sledge. It was broken. He had to run to use the phone for help. He went next door and dropped his sack in the middle of the garden. Inside the sack, Rose found some colorful biscuits. She was starving by now and could not resist eating the biscuits. At first, Rose felt happy that she did not feel hungry anymore. But Rose started to change color. She went from white to purple to blue, green, yellow, orange, red, blue. She was so colorful. <laughs> Susie eventually came home, and with shock she saw the multicolored dog. She knew it was Rose as she had her name on the collar. My final reading is from The Danger Zone by Jerry L. Mills. The Danger Zone Chapter 1 The Unofficial Organization of Your Company Let's start this book by sharing some information that I have learned from decades of working with the owners of privately held companies. They don't teach this in college. Your understanding of this information should assist you in the future as your company grows. Some authors have attempted to explain these subjects, but none have done so in the concise manner that you will see here. Excluded from this book is unrealistic idealism. I share these experiences as your peer, with the hope you will avoid the pain of reinventing the wheel. Business pioneers have already paved the way for us to avoid certain pitfalls and to meet our goals more efficiently. Thanks for listening.